introduce today's speaker, to Cynthia Boas from the Department of Political Science. This is the second of our four lectures that are sort of geared to the notion of human rights and what we can do about them in the world. Last week, we watched a little video about people power at the end of uh, last week's lecture from Rashi Singh on the United Nations. So Cynthia Boas is an expert on people power and on world movements and how people have organized to make change in the world. That's what she studies in her field. So if you have questions about that, you can ask her about that at the end of today's talk as well. And with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Cynthia Boas, who will speak to us about people power and global movements. OK, great. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, let me make sure that you guys can hear me. Is this good? OK. Um, also, I'd forgotten that this room is only either all lights or no lights. And I'd prefer that I don't give you more incentive to nod off. Um, so I want to leave the lights on for the most part, except when I'm showing a couple video clips. But I need to know, can you see this in the back? Because the other option is I can just briefly turn off the lights for each slide so you can see the slide for a minute. Do you want me to do that? OK, we don't need to do that with this one. This is just the introductory slide. OK. All right, so um, thank you, Tim, for that introduction. Thank you, War and Peace Lecture Series, for bringing me back. Um, I apologize for taking you away from the game six of the World Series. For some reason, my talks always happen to fall, hey, Connie, always happen to fall um, on some big game. So I'm always competing with something. I just have bad luck with that. So anyway, thank you for being here. Um, so as I understand it, I am one in a series of speakers that you're having on the subject of civil resistance. Is that right? There are four altogether. So last week, you heard from Rashmi. OK, and next week? Oh, Kurt Boyd, and then who's after that? Michael Nagler? OK, perfect. All right, so um, as Tim mentioned, my area of interest and expertise in my field of political science is on a phenomenon that has a lot of different names. So in last week's video, you heard it referred to as civil resistance. <clears throat> they also refer to it as people power, like Tim just did. Um, it's also sometimes called nonviolent action or nonviolent strategy or even nonviolent conflict. And there are some minor distinctions between those terms, but we don't need to worry about, about them here. Um, but I'm just letting you know right off the bat that I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. I just don't like to be redundant. I don't like to say nonviolent struggle 10 times in the same paragraph. So if you hear me using the terminology interchangeably, it's OK. Um, since your class has an international focus, a question, the, the question that I wanted to raise to get the conversation going today is the question of what can people do when states fail to uphold their international obligations? So next week, when Kurt Boyd is here, you're going to hear a lot more about what those specific international obligations are and should be. And I think you're, you should expect to have a pretty vibrant conversation about the kinds of things that states are, are um, at least we hope, um, will do um, in terms of upholding their obligations internationally. So to rephrase the question, what can people do, citizens of states or citizens of the world do, when states violate any of the articles in, say, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or just violate any basic human rights. So international law, as you probably all know, is there to provide a basic guideline. But if you've studied the United Nations at all, or international law at all, you know that it lacks an enforcement mechanism. So, the United Nations is very limited in what measures it can take to sanction states. And then it's only if something rises to the level of a global security threat that the United Nations Security Council will even consider a resolution. And then even if it gets to that stage, the politics of the veto power 
held by the five permanent members, the most powerful members of the Security Council, the United States, France, Russia, China, and the UK, because they hold on to the veto power, the ability to say no to any resolution, any single one of them says no, it doesn't get passed, then you're still not guaranteed a response to something that is considered a global security threat. So in recent decades, a number of injustices by states against their own people have been resisted by citizens. Citizens have the power to force a spotlight onto injustice and to garner global sympathy, to galvanize like-minded people, and to delegitimize and embarrass regimes. And with enough numbers, citizens can even stop the flow of resources from other states and entities, such as corporations, coming into the offending state. Now, most of those struggles start out at the national level, but many become what's called transnational because of the global nature of the issue that's being addressed, or being redressed is probably a better word. <clears throat> so sometimes the issue literally crosses borders, as in the case of human trafficking. Sometimes the injustice has the consequence of affecting the states around it, such as ethnic cleansing and refugee movements or environmental disasters. Social issues are almost always global issues, and therefore, they're already primed for solidarity movements around the world. And that would include issues like women's rights, LGBT rights, and labor rights, amongst others. In fact, it's rare that a national movement actually stays national, even when none of the above conditions are met. Because movements tend to learn from other struggles and will often call upon veterans of an earlier successful struggle to offer guidance on organizational, logistic, or strategic issues. <clears throat> so the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa learned from the struggle in the Philippines, who themselves had learned from the solidarity movement in Poland. And all of those struggles learned from the US civil rights movement which itself had been largely informed by the Indian independence movement led by Gandhi. Today, Serbs who helped to overthrow Milosevic are teaching Egyptians and Syrians about nonviolent strategy. And Ukrainians who ousted a corrupt regime in 2004 are working with Russians and Belarusians. Chileans who forced Pinochet from power in the 1980s are now offering support to struggles throughout Latin America. And that list goes on. So these connections are forged across the globe. So this, we might want to turn the light off just for a second. <clears throat> this is a list of movements that have become transnational in nature. So all of the injustices listed here are in violation of international law or norms and because international institutions have not been able to resolve them, citizens have taken up the cause themselves. So you can see that every region of the world here is represented. And by the way, I just want to say this is not an exhaustive list, either of issues or of countries. But every region of the world is represented. There's a huge spectrum of types of issues from land rights to anti-globalization, which by the way, um, sorry, the slide is a little old. I would put the umbrella movement um, in Hong Kong in there as well. Um, anti-torture, LGBT, anti-racism, women's suffrage, and so on. So, all right. So now you're looking at a list of issues and a list of places around the world where citizens have organized in response to some form of injustice. So the question is, how do people do it? How do people actually fight in a situation where their rights or liberties are being deprived? 
Well, this is where we come to this term people power, civil resistance, or nonviolent strategy. So we'll start with the most basic question, what is it? In its most basic definition, it's a method by which ordinary people, like you, not that you're ordinary, but meaning that you are capable of doing this, where you mobilize, you come together and you mobilize and then you fight for your rights using disruptive actions, but without using violence. Okay, the concept of disobedience, refusing to obey whatever it is the regime or oppressor is asking you to do, or conversely doing something that they're asking you not to do, that is at the heart of civil resistance. It can take a number of different forms. The most common is protest, public protest. People turning out into, I'm sorry, I should correct that. It's not that that's the most common. That's the most visible. The most visible form of um, people power resistance, and the one with which I'm guessing most of you are most familiar, is public protest. So when people pour out onto the streets, like they have been in the Umbrella Revolution. <clears throat> but protest is just one form of resistance. And I would actually argue the least efficacious. It's kind of ironic. It's the one we associate most closely with the phenomenon, but the one that at the end of the day tends to have really the least amount of um, influence over the final result. And we can talk later about why that is if you want. Um, persuasion, okay, which may be a better term for that is coercion. <laughs> um, forcing the opponent into the position of having to change their mind or their behavior. Non-cooperation and the most aggressive form of nonviolent strategy is nonviolent intervention. Nonviolent strategy is a very active phenomenon. So sometimes when we hear the term nonviolence or maybe even nonviolent action, we tend to, to default to the idea that it's, it's passivity or weakness or even pacifism. And so I'm here to tell you that all of those assumptions are wrong, that Gandhi called this phenomenon the most activist force in the world. So it's a, it's a little bit unfortunate that, um, that there is this very common uh, misunderstanding that because of the use of the term non in nonviolent that it implies weakness. I would actually argue, and I, I will argue in a minute, that um, the waging of a nonviolent struggle requires m much more courage than the waging of an armed struggle. And um, it also requires a level of organization and discipline and unity that any military force in the world would be envious of. So how does it work in terms of the dynamic? Well, we can look at these things as stages or steps. They don't always happen in this order, but these are all key. Through the implementation of strategic nonviolent action, organized and disciplined action, a broad-based civic movement drives up the costs of repression. And when I say cost, I mean that both in a literal sense, it costs them money and resources, but also in a more figurative sense, that um, you, you cost the opponent legitimacy or moral authority or, or other things, resources that are a little more intrinsic that they need in order to, to, to stay in power. So by driving up the cost of repression, you reduce the economic and political support that an oppressor needs in order to keep control. So a couple of good examples of where we have seen this happen are South Africa during the anti-apartheid movement, Poland during the Solidarity Movement, which it was a movement that began with 
um, <clears throat> the demand for free labor unions in Poland, and it turned into one of the first um, democracy, pro-democracy or democratic struggles of um, the last 30 years. The US Civil Rights Movement also did a very good job at this. <clears throat> When people collectively deprive a ruler of their consent, meaning they individually decide to say no to the lie, whatever the big lie is, it might just be the lie that the regime that's in power has a legitimate right to be there. And when they do that in the aggregate, it becomes extraordinarily powerful. So refusing to be complicit can be, can be very, very effective in creating morale and solidarity across citizens and even across countries. So good examples <clears throat> there might be in some of the recent Arab Spring cases, Egypt um, and Tunisia and Bahrain, um, also in Chile and even the Danish resistance to the Third Reich. These are all examples of places where a big portion of the resistance involved people just standing up and publicly saying what they're saying, what the regime is saying, is a lie. And we don't believe it. And then thirdly, and I'll get more into this concept in a minute, but when the system's own defenders, okay, that doesn't just mean people that are part of the regime officially, but any organization or institution that doesn't actively resist the regime, we could argue is complicit in it, but when those defenders begin to doubt whether that regime will survive, then the balance of power um, shifts to those who are using the civilian-based resistance. And both the movement and the methods, so those nonviolent civil resistance methods, legitimacy increases, and it opens up political space, sometimes for genuine democracy to take place. All right. Um, in order to really understand how the phenomenon works, we, also, we have to look at uh, our assumptions about power. So, can we turn off the slide for or light for the slide for just a second? Um, read an article too. You read an article by Jean Sharp? Yeah. Oh, that's good. What was the article? Okay. All right. So, th so then, if you read an article by Jean Sharp, th these concepts of power should be familiar to you. But in order to really understand the phenomenon of civil resistance, you have to reject the conventional wisdom about power. The idea that power is simply top down and is something that some exogenous force who has more power than you do is exerting something over you, okay? Sharp argues that power, in this case he's referring to power of the oppressor or the nation state entity, whoever it is that's violating, um, these, these basic laws of human rights or um, norms, um, that their power is actually based on the obedience and the consent of their own people, okay, not on the monopoly of force. That's a really key thing to understand, right? Because what he's saying is it's not all the weapons and the guns and the huge militaries that give states their power. It's the, <laughs> it's the extent to which people agree to go along, okay? So that's number one. Number two is that um, the use of violence by a nation state entity, but we can apply this, I would argue, in almost any context, you know, with a couple of exceptions like self-defense and that sort of thing. Um, the use of violence almost always demonstrates weakness on the side of the person or entity that is using the violence. Because what it's doing is it's demonstrating the loss of voluntary compliance by the other party. 
So there's actually an inverse relationship between power and violence, which you would not know if you've ever turned on American cable news and have watched any sort of news coverage of anything having to do with civil resistance or war or conflict in general, because violence is almost always treated in conventional media as a sign of strength. But I'm here to tell you that at least in this context, when we're talking about people power and how to understand the relationship between an oppressor and how citizens respond to that oppression, using violence against citizens who are resisting you is a sign that you as a state or an opponent are feeling threatened. Uh, a third thing that Sharp points Sharp points out that is also relevant is that regimes are not monolithic, okay? By this, he means to say that re regimes, nation states, are made up of individual human beings. And those individual human beings should be regarded as individual human beings. And they don't all have the same interests or even the same worldview, even if they're all employed by that same state. And this will become more relevant in a second. And then lastly, he argues that power is never permanent and that everybody who's in power, who's holding power as um, a nation state or oppressor has to constantly replenish their power. That's relevant because that means there's always windows of opportunity for citizens who want to organize against a corrupt or oppressive regime. All right, so um, a second ago I mentioned that regimes are not monolithic. So one of the reasons that we make this assumption is because we need to demonstrate how this concept of pillars of support works. I'm going to make this PowerPoint available to you all, by the way, so you don't have to transcribe the notes. I'll, I mean, you can write down whatever works for you right now, but you'll have access to this. Okay so, um, okay, so regimes are not monolithic, meaning they're made up of individual people. This is important to know because a key strategy of the types of movements that we're talking about is to identify these things called pillars of support. These organizations or institutions that help keep the system of injustice in place. And then they weaken those pillars by pulling individual people out of them, okay? So examples of pillars of support um, in, in most places would be things like court systems, media, sometimes universities, um, and then really key, are security forces, military and police, <clears throat> the ones who actually carry out and enforce the orders of the regime. In, in virtually every case of nonviolent struggle that I can think of, the final pillar to go is the police force, the police forces. And that they, they always leave even after um, military. Does anybody have any? Thoughts on why that might be? Why it's harder to convert or pull police forces away from their strong core loyalty to a regime than it is military? I know that some of my students who are in my nonviolent strategies class know the answer to this, but I'm curious if anyone else has an idea, a guess. All right, so Zach. You want to help us out with this? Why are police the last to go as opposed to military? Or Connie? Yeah, <laughs> I, they didn't know I was going to put them on the spot. Well, the police are last to go because they're employed and paid directly by that regime. Okay. Exactly. So in a lot of the country cases that we're looking at, so if you looked at all that list of countries that I put up on the board earlier with the different types of struggles, in many of those places, 
The military is conscripted, meaning that people have to join it, right? It's not optional. And it's usually also not compensated very well. So <clears throat> unless someone is a very high-ranking uh, military officer, the odds are that their loyalty to the regime is a little tenuous, right? They may even feel resentful of it. Whereas with police, it's a much more prestigious job in a lot of contexts because it's usually very well paying and because it's voluntary. People sign up to be in the police. So, you know, in, you know, when we look at struggles from the outside, you'll see sometimes that um, when a regime is beginning the process of cracking down, they first send in military. And um, if they don't get the job done, right, if people continue to push back, then they'll send in police because they're usually willing to be a little bit more brutal, frankly. Um, and then if that doesn't work, that's when you bring in mercenaries or paramilitary, um, you know, like or if any of you are familiar with the case of Iran, they have the besiege, um, groups like that. Okay, so I'm spending a lot of time on this concept. So, um, oops. So I made a little graphic for you. Can you see that? Can you see the arrows? I'm just going to turn it off just for this because I spent extra time on this. I want you to see it. So the idea is you pull people out of the pillars as opposed to trying to push on them. I know that sounds like a silly distinction, but it's important. The idea is you want to appeal to them, either to their interests or, in some cases, maybe their conscience. You'll hear from Michael Nagler in a couple weeks, and he'll make that case. But you want them to know that their loyalty to the regime is not serving them. And it's in their best interest, in one way or another, to either join the struggle or at least to not continue to um, impede it. Okay, so you pull people out. If you push people, <laughs> to use that, continue with that metaphor, if you push people that are in the pillars, they, they tend to um, galvanize around that core. It actually, you know, like if you make police your enemy in the context of a struggle, you attack police. That's a very, very bad strategy because that's actually going to make them more likely to galvanize even more strongly around the regime or the government or whoever it is that is employing them and giving them orders. <clears throat> so when enough individuals within the individual pillars have withdrawn their support, the pillars become neutralized one by one until finally the policy or system of injustice can't sustain itself and it comes crashing down. Now that's a very oversimplified version of what happens. <clears throat> Obviously it's much more complex than that. Um, so I'm going to show you just a couple clips. These are all very short, two minutes each, literally. One of them is one minute, I think, um, that are, I think, just nice little examples of this phenomenon, people power, civil resistance in action from different parts of the world. So the first one is um, just a short clip, an interview actually about the Umbrella Revolution that's going on in Hong Kong. Um, the second is an excerpt from a film called Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which is, a, has anybody seen this? Have you guys watched this in here ever? Oh, you should show this. <clears throat> it's a story of, <clears throat> Um, the women of Liberia who organized to, um, well, to do two things. One, to force Charles Taylor out of power, very brutal tyrant, and two, to force their country to enter peace talks with several surrounding countries that it was at war with. And they used some very clever strategies to force the men of their government to come to the peace talks, to come to the peace, the, you know, the round table for peace talks, which they'll talk about in this clip. By the way, two of the women who were involved in that struggle won the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago. One is an activist, Lema Bowe, um, and the other is Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, who went on to become um, the first female president of um, an African country. So anyway, 
The third clip is an excerpt from a documentary on the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. It's just a, um, just a quick summary of the end of that struggle. I think most of you are probably familiar with kind of the basic dynamics of what happened at the end of apartheid. Um, and then last, I ha actually have had this clip in here for a couple of years um, before she won the Peace Prize, but this is a clip of um, Malala on Jon Stewart uh, a couple of years ago when um, she was 14 or 15 years old. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'll just, sh we'll go through each of those really briefly. Um, I don't know how to scroll though, so I need help. I'm sorry I didn't cue them up in advance. I should have done that. So this is the longest one, and it's four. Okay, so before we go to the next clip, I just want to follow up on that with a couple of points. I, I, I wanted you to see that for a few reasons. <clears throat> okay, one is that one is that it highlights that there's a role for everyone in the society in the struggle. Anybody can play a role. So you don't necessarily have to engage in high risk, high visibility actions. You can still contribute to a struggle in other ways, which is what he was saying. You know, you can sit at home and design art and logos for the movement if that's your comfort zone, but you can still contribute. And that's really essential because unity is a critical principle of successful nonviolent struggle. But I think also saying that there's a role for everyone highlights the fact that in any successful movement, there are no, and there should be no, demographics that are systematically left out of the struggle. So, you know, whether you're male or female, whether you're young or old, you know, whether you're urban or rural, whether you're a worker or student, you should be able to contribute. And you can, there is a place for you if the movement is doing, has organized itself well and is, in, is doing the right things. Um, also, I like the fact, and I, I think um, Tim will appreciate this too, that you know, in that clip he talked about the role of art and creativity in struggles, and that's essential in a lot of movements because it can be um, very, it can be a big morale booster, especially in contexts where there's a lot of fear and people are feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, having a place for expression through art is um, a way to help diminish fear and to bring people together. Um, so in terms of boosting morale and solidarity, you know, any kind of creative, it's not just enough to be um, creative actions, although those are good too, but um, you know, creative contributions um, to struggles are really essential. And you, you, know, you look back at the history of struggles, you'll see that they all have you know, some sort of art or creative endeavor associated with them. Um, and then lastly, the other thing I wanted to point out from that video is that he mentions the role of social media, um, which has really revolutionized, pun intended, the way that movements are done. Because it is now much more difficult for regimes to engage in repressive behavior with impunity because people can take pictures or they can take video and then they can upload them you know, to YouTube. In fact, some of you might know the story of Iran in 2009, the Green Movement and um, the, the organized resistance to the regime's stealing of an election. And a woman named Nita, who was actually not even part of the movement, she was just observing, she was shot and killed by the regime's paramilitary and the entire incident was caught on camera, on video, somebody's um, iPhone um, or um, handheld, um, <clears throat> and then posted to YouTube. And that, Nita's death became the galvanizing force for that movement. Once that video went viral, and it went viral quickly, the people of Iran began to turn out in in 10 times or 100 times the numbers that they had been turning out to the streets um, previously. And it was also an event that galvanized global sympathy for 
the democratic movement in Iran, which, by the way, is ongoing. I know that we've stopped hearing about it because it's no longer an, on the international cameras because the regime is not openly repressing. So therefore, it's not considered worthy of covering, but it is still going on. OK, um, next video is the short clip. This one's only one minute long um, from the Liberian struggle and the documentary Pray the Devil Back to Hell. <laughs> so that, the woman who was just speaking, that's Lema Gaboe, the one who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and what I didn't mention about the Liberian struggle, and I should have mentioned, is it's also a really good example of the issue of unity across religion. Because what happened in Liberia was that Christian and Muslim women organized together to put pressure on the men in that society. Um, OK, the third example is um, from the end of the apartheid um, struggle in South Africa. So that was Desmond Tutu. Um, also former Peace Prize winner and one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Um, you'll probably hear a little bit more about him in Michael Nagler's talk. And then last, I'm going to show you an excerpt of Malala, whose name most of you should know, I'm guessing, because of the recent um, awarding of a Peace Prize. She's the youngest recipient at the age of 17 to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize. And in this short video clip, you'll see why. The video is actually about 10 minutes long, but if we can stop it at 1.48, that would be great. All right, that's pretty amazing, right? <laughs> She's 16 at the time of that interview. She was 14 at the time that she stood up to the Taliban um, in her town um, by going to school and was shot in the head. OK. Um, <clears throat> now, following on the video clips and some of the discussion that we've already had, I, I just want to bring up a couple of common but questionable claims or misconceptions about nonviolent action. To be perfectly honest, this list could be 10 times this long. But I'm going to limit it to what are some of the most common misconceptions so we can um, address those. So the first, and this, I'm guessing this is one that you've heard a lot, is that nonviolent resistance can't succeed against powerful, repressive, or authoritarian regimes. In other words, regimes that are really willing to be openly brutal and to use all of their extensive military power against their own citizens. Okay? But in, in fact, there are a number of real world cases that belie this. Chile, in the case of Pinochet. South Africa under apartheid, Milosevic in Serbia, Mubarak in Egypt, okay? And that list goes on and on. In fact, there are several examples of successful resistance against the Third Reich during World War II. And if you haven't studied those, I strongly suggest that you do because somehow those have gotten, you know, lost in the, you know, the glorification of the U.S. entry into the war and you know, the um, allied powers saving the world. But there are some, some really deeply moving and, frankly, highly impressive examples of resistance. And two of the ones I'll mention, if this is of interest to you, um, are one called, there's one called the White Rose Resistance, which took place in Munich starting in 1943. It was led and organized and carried out by a small handful of college students and their college professor. And um, most of the key members of that group were discovered and um, beheaded by the regime. But they, they left a legacy that um, today, to this day in, in Germany, is still revered, um, especially if you go to Munich. There's also a film called Sophie Scholl about um, a young woman um, who was the, the key, she was 22 years old at the time, um, who was you know, one of the two key strategists in that struggle. Um, and then um, another example of resistance against the Third Reich was called the Rosenstrasse. And that was a group of German women who were married to Jewish men who resisted the regime by saving their husbands. Um, that's also extremely impressive. You know what, I'll give you a third example, which was the Danish resistance to the Nazis in Denmark. The Danes resist the Third Reich 
through a strategy that was called um, resistance disguised as collaboration. They made it look like they were collaborating with um, Hitler's regime when in fact they were undermining it behind the scenes. They ended up saving 6,700 of Denmark's 7,000 Jews. That's also an example worth looking into. Um, all right, second common but questionable claim is that nonviolent resistance is ineffective for achieving difficult demands like removing dictators um, and that it only works for smaller, lower level, easier kinds of demands. I just gave you a bunch of examples, Chile, Egypt, Serbia, um, South Africa, also the Philippines, um, Tunisia, Poland, um, you're free to shout out other cases if you can think of it, where that's not the case. This kind of resistance can work against almost any kind of injustice and at almost any level. And then um, the third thing, and I actually think Michael Nagler is going to talk about this in two weeks, is that the perception that violence doesn't always work, but that it works better than nonviolence. Okay. And I'm not going to call anybody out, but I'm guessing a lot of you, um, maybe not because this is a War and Peace lecture series and you've been exposed to your enlightened professors for the last several weeks, but I'm guessing a lot of us have started out with this perception that, yeah, nonviolence would be ideal, you know, in a perfect world, but we're dealing with the real world. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. We're dealing with the real world here. Let's look at the real world. Violence works better. And I think that we default to that assumption because we see so much of it. And maybe because violence does tend to produce results in the short term. That's the advantage of violence, is that it looks like it's having an effect like in the moment, but you never know what the long-term effect is going to be, what the long-term consequence is. In nonviolent struggle, it's just the reverse, right? You tend to not see effects for some time, so patience is a virtue associated with nonviolent struggle. But when you get those effects, they tend to be more long-lasting, sometimes even permanent. You, know, you can fundamentally alter the state of things through nonviolent struggle. You can't do that with violence because violence isn't an ideology. It's not like a force unto itself. It's just a tool. It's a means to an end. And it's not creative, right? It doesn't, violence doesn't offer any alternative to the status quo. It just deconstructs. So in many of these examples where we think that violence has worked or is working, I would suggest taking a longer view of that of that um, of that case. Okay. Um, all right. Related to this, and I just want to mention this briefly, is that there are a number of common frames or um, memes that emerge in media, and I bring this up to kind of follow on misconceptions, and also because I have a special interest in how media covers civil resistance. And these things also tend to reinforce our views and assumptions about people power and our ability to see it when it's happening and then our ability to understand why it's succeeding when it's succeeding or even to recognize that it is succeeding. Um, so some of the common media frames that we see when media covers this phenomenon is that repression is treated as more interesting than resistance. So you've all heard the, the, the uh, phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, the idea that media tend to focus in on sensationalistic violence. Well, that's, that's true. That's accurate, in, in, at least in relation to this phenomenon. It's much harder to get complex, nuanced, contextualized coverage of people power struggles from the bottom up because for whatever reason, um, it's regarded as not as sexy as seeing people be brutalized. There's also the perception that violence or force are more powerful means of waging a conflict than engaging in nonviolent struggle. 
um, which goes along with you know, the first frame. Um, I, I think a good example of this, I keep referring to Iran in 2009, a good example of this is when, um, how many of you are familiar with that, with the Green Movement, 2009, people of Iran? OK, so only a couple of you raise your hand. So a quick abridged version of this is that in, um, OK, first of all, Iran has a very long but relatively unknown outside of Iran history of civil resistance and democratic action by its citizens. Very rich history. And um, there have been different forms of resistance going on against that regime for many, many, many decades, including resistance by women and labor organizers and LGBT rights advocates and so on and so forth. Okay, But what happened in 2009 was that the regime, in a nutshell, stole an election. There was a pro-democratic reformer candidate who came in and became very popular, especially with young people who were interested in having a more open democratic regime. And um, his name was Mousavi. And he actually won the election in terms of you know, the percentage of the vote that he got. But the regime claimed that his people had stolen the election. And, and so they, they claimed that it was not the election result that Mousavi was claiming, as well as every major institution, global institution entity that was observing the elections claimed. They said that it was illegitimate. Um, and Ahmadinejad, the regime's candidate, um, claimed victory. So the people of Iran were not happy about this. And on top of many, many other things that, at grievances that they had been um, dealing with for decades, this became you know, the final straw. And so the people of Iran began to pour out onto the streets, particularly in Tehran, in these massive election protests, demanding that the regime acknowledge the official, you know, the legitimate results of, of Mousavi's um, victory. So they ultimately didn't get their way. Um, but you know, it was a really powerful moment in order to be able to see how much the people of Iran were really engaged in um, and willing to fight for the future of their country. And that resistance, as I mentioned a second ago, still goes on. It just goes on in you know, slightly less visible ways. Now, the reason I bring this up in, con in this context is the way, the way that media covered that few months when those protests were really at their zenith was fascinating. It covered them right at the beginning when people came out onto the streets as, um, you know, like a shock. Like, oh my God, this is such a repressive country. How come these people are coming out onto the streets? Isn't this kind of dangerous? And then it kind of, you know, went under the radar. Some networks and media entities were still continuing to talk about it, but it sort of moved to the background until about eight weeks in, the regime cracked down. Okay, so I mentioned Nita being killed, but there are many other things, many other examples of extreme violence that the regime used at that point. Once that happened, it was all over the news. CNN, MSNBC, Fox, BBC, Al Jazeera, everywhere. And the way that the story was being told was regime is, quote, restoring normalcy, or regime is, quote, asserting strength, okay? Those were the kinds of memes and the terminology that was being used to describe what was major acts of brutal repression against a really powerful civil resistance movement that was clearly scaring the crap out of that government. But nobody, no, nobody in conventional media covered the story that way. They all covered it as though this was the moment at which the regime wasn't going to take it anymore and was finally going to exert its strength. Okay? So, and, I, and I think, by the way, that this is not usually intentional. I think that media usually does this inadvertently. It's a, it's a default to the idea that seeing major acts of violence is synonymous with seeing an exerting of strength. But it really damaged the morale of the activists in Iran who also get to see CNN and Fox and MSNBC and see that their story is being covered as though they're losing. When you know they knew in their hearts that, that they were having an impact. But it's impossible 
to win any, any one of these struggles, and this, by the way, is one of the things that makes them transnational, without the sympathy or solidarity of the global audience. So if the rest of the world thinks that you can't do it, you're probably not going to do it. Which I would argue is why you, as global citizens, have a responsibility, by the way, to be really conscious and aware, and maybe even solidarity with some of these struggles. Um, also, media tends to talk about them as power being top down rather than bottom up. I talked about that a few minutes ago, Gene Sharp. Also, they talk about powers being monolithic rather than pluralistic. You know, so the regime does this, right? As though it's just one, you know, <laughs> Borg type entity with one mind. Um, and then also, you know, it's interesting. This last one. There's a common perception that conflict itself is undesirable. If you're a fan of democracy or of you know democratic institutions or norms or practices in any way, shape, or form, then you have to embrace the notion of conflict, okay? Because conflict is at the heart of democracy. It's all about disagreement. So it's the places where you see people getting 90% of the vote that you need to be really suspicious of. You know, where there are deep conflicts, it's, that's great, that's healthy. So this whole phenomenon that I've been talking about for the last 55 minutes or so um, is all about conflict. It's all about waging conflict nonviolently. Okay, it's not about resolving conflict, although that would be nice ultimately at the end of the day. It's not about avoiding conflict. Okay, it's about actively engaging it and then waging it in a way that is going to win and get you the best long-term results and everybody else the best long-term results possible, the ones most consistent with humanity and democracy and all of these other values. All right, so um, I'm going to move through these, la these last ones quickly. There is a strong record for the success of nonviolent struggle. I'm not going to go through it all, but I will tell you that nonviolent struggle succeeds much more frequently than armed struggle. And a great source for this is a book by a couple friends of mine, Maria Steffen and Erica Chenoweth, called Why Civil Resistance Works. They're the first ones to empirically study hundreds of cases of nonviolent struggle across um, about a century. And they found some really interesting things. The reason, the reasons that nonviolent struggle works better than armed struggle is because repression backfires and repression is costly. Here's a couple of examples. These come, this, this data comes from Maria and Erica's book. Um, you can see just with you know, the, the, um, the bar graphs there, nonviolent struggles tend to be much more successful than armed struggles. This is actually a comparison of success rates between violent and nonviolent campaigns for over a 100 year period. This um, looks at the rates of violent versus nonviolent campaigns um, over time. Highly statistically significant result, by the way. You don't get better than that. Those of you who know your statistics. Um, and you can see that there's a trend that over time, the success of violent resistance, armed struggle, um, has declined, whereas the success of nonviolent struggle has increased. Um, I'm going to leave this for you to look at um, when I send your power, the PowerPoint to Tim. But these are all arguments for why it's better to maintain nonviolent discipline, to stay nonviolent, as opposed to defaulting to the use of violence, even when things seem really bad or you're really frustrated or somebody has used violence against you. And then a couple of final questions that I want you to think about or you know, leave you with. <clears throat> because this is a global class with a global perspective, um, I think it's important to ask yourself, what should the role of the United States be in assisting movements? like the ones we've been looking at around the world, if anything? You know, is there a risk of commandeering someone else's struggle? That's a really serious problem. Why do we know so little about this phenomenon as compared to violent conflicts? What's the role of people power in delegitimizing violence as a force for change? And I would also add to that in delegitimizing terrorism as a method of forcing change. Because when the Egyptian people succeeded in 2011, a lot of their, a lot of Al-Qaeda's, you know, potential recruitment pool 
saw that and thought, oh my god, there's another alternative. We don't have to resort to this extreme form of violence. And then what can we as individual US citizens do to support struggles? OK, if we can turn off the lights for this, because I made you a quick little um, photo montage. All of women in struggles, by the way, because these were all very powerful images. And I'll end with this. I should put this to music, but um, one of these days I will. This is in Russia, by the way, the left-hand one. That's a group called Femin. Some of you know her, or you will soon. Yeah, they know her. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, and I can hang out for another 15, maybe 20 minutes or no, so if anybody has questions. Okay. How about three minutes worth of questions? Okay, three minutes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I forgot about your game. It depends on the context because um, in, in some, I, okay, I, I would not say collapse of the military power, but I would say, you're, you're talking about the, are the military, do, do the military forces have to be totally neutralized? Is that what you're saying? Be one to the side of the people. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Although they don't necessarily have to overtly step over to the side of the people in that they're, they're now on the streets with them. But they have to be willing to no longer carry out the regime's orders. And depending on the context, there are different ways that that can happen. Like, if it's a really dangerous place for you know, a soldier to ignore an order from a commanding officer, but that person sympathizes with the movement or maybe doesn't want to shoot into a crowd because you know, their friends or family members might be in it, there are ways there, there are ways around that. And so, you know, a common, um, a common meme amongst security officers in a context like that is that um, it's much harder to punish um, uh, incompetence than it is to punish outright insubordination. So what will happen is that a lot of, of um, officers will, like, accidentally forget to carry out an order or you know there's a great example from Serbia in 2000 where um, there were half a million people on the streets in Belgrade and um, Milosevic ordered um, some military helicopters to drop tear gas onto the protesters and um, somehow it didn't happen and when he asked later you know why wasn't this order carried out all of the the helicopter pilots said oh it was too cloudy we couldn't see and you know we couldn't we couldn't drop the tear gas when we couldn't see the target. If you go back and you look at the weather for October 5th, 2000 in Belgrade, the sky was blue as the, you know, I could see clear as a bell. Um, so things like that happen all the time. So um, you don't have to actively win them over, but you definitely have to at least get them to not want to be willing to carry out the orders. Where is it? Oh, yeah. That's a very good question. Um, well, for, I think the, the main reason is that knowledge about the phenomenon is growing, and specifically knowledge about um, its long-term success and um, you know, the, the, the fact that in many of these different settings, people have been waging armed struggle, you know, in some cases for decades or even centuries, and usually, um, you know, very, with, with very futile results. So there's a lot of um, frustration or, and demoralization that has gone along with um, armed resistance. A, a good example is in Burma, where, um, you know, in, in that case, you know, there, there's been armed resistance against that military junta for 60 years, 
And you know, just maybe in the last 30 years, um, activists have begun, begun adopting nonviolent methods because they've come to realize the futility of, of violence. So that's one reason I think also we're spreading more knowledge and information about it. I think um, people are coming to really understand the power of the phenomenon. The one place in the world where I would say that there's a major exception to that is the United States. Although, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we understood it in the 60s or, you know, this, during the civil rights era, at least so the civil rights activists did. Um, and then it's, it faded for some time. Maybe now with, you know, recent events, Occupy, Ferguson, um, so on, may change. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking? Are you asking about solidarity, or? I'm, I'm asking like with the violence versus non-violence. Because he had asked what was the reason why it come forward. Now I'm just asking, do you think perhaps it's because all the world nations who have come together relatively in the modern age? Oh. That has played a bigger role in why non-violence has succeeded. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, definitely communication. You know, and coordination and. Um, you know, the ability to recognize and understand what's happening in other parts of the world, I think, is key. Because I, you know, started by saying that this struggle learned from this struggle and so on and so on. Um, so there is kind of a domino effect. And, and probably, yeah, the, the, um, the growth of international institutions that are designed to, um, you know, create norms and um, established precedent um, about you know certain types of behaviors has probably legitimized a lot of these types of struggles in the eyes of citizens um, who may not have appreciated them a hundred years ago. Yeah. I want to take a shot at that one too. Yeah, sure. Which is just to say, or to say something that I want to say about the reading anyway, which is that remember Shelley, ye are many and they are few. Shelley was one of Gandhi's favorite authors. Shelley got that from reading the Hindu philosophy of Ahimsa, which is in your reading for this week. So it connects back to long-standing principles in the Hinduism about nonviolence that inspired Shelley to write a poem, The Master of Anarchy, which made him one of Gandhi's favorite authors, which led to the tradition that Cynthia started to talk about today. So yes, it's been more effective in the 20th century, but it also has long philosophical roots. Which, that's just why. And I love that you have the umbrella guy say, go art, because I love oh, art. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last point, there was a year that Andy Lopez was shot by the deputy sheriff, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, community protests. And I'm wondering how you assess the tactics of the, the police of uh, Andy Lopez? Yeah. The um, well, I think that, that um, the, the group has done a, a very good job of making sure that that issue doesn't get swept under the rug, which is the, the proximate thing that has to be done. You, you have to make sure that everybody remembers, right, and that the, so, and that the power of that um, injustice is still salient. And so I think that it's, it's done a very good job at that, and also at you know, communicating to the larger audience you know, who may have had their heads in the sand about some of the dynamics underlying, you know, the socioeconomic and um, racial ethnic dynamics underlying a lot of this. Um, you know, that there, there are, you know, there are some realities here that we can no longer continue to, you know, to ignore. Um, I, I'm not, I don't know what the, if there are any defined objectives of the group. Um, I'm going to be curious to know if there are, um, because that would tell me a little bit more about um, the level and the quality of the organizing. I would also be interested in whether or not there was a, 
a, some sort of grand strategy because the tactics that are used by any, any group or any movement should, in, should reinforce some organizing strategy you know, that, that, that um, looks at the, the big picture um, and the long term, the achievement of a long term and winnable goal. So I, I would say that, that if that hasn't been done, that's probably the first thing that needs to be done is to define one or two very clear achievable objectives that would um, move the group or the movement forward in you know, the achievement of the ulti ultimate big goal, which I assume is um, racial justice and probably um, uh, humane treatment um, or behavior by security forces, police officers. But I just need to know more about it. It's a great topic. We, I mentioned that a little bit. Let's uh, go ahead and give uh, Dr. Bowes. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.